Greetings, urban farmers, gardeners, and healthy food visionaries. Greg Peterson here, and welcome to the 307th episode of the Urban Farm Podcast, where three days a week we work together educating and inspiring you to become part of your food revolution. Growing plants that thrive in your yard is a lot easier than you think. It starts with saving your own seeds and letting them remember what they already learned. Just text SEEDS to 33444 or visit IWANTTOSAVESEEDS.COM and you will receive our free webinar about why seeds matter, why saving them is easy, and how to save your own. Today on our podcast, we have someone who has seen more happen in the permaculture movement than anyone we have spoken to yet. We're talking with Joel Salatin. Joel and his family own Polyface Farm in Virginia's Shenandoah Valley. Featured in the iconic foodie book Omnivore's Dilemma and award-winning film Food, Inc., the farm's moniker is Healing the Land One Bite at a Time. A prolific author, 12 books to date, and speaker, he promotes local food systems, freedom of choice food, and farming systems that build the commons. Welcome to the show today, Joel. Are you ready to rock? Yes, Greg. Thank you for having me. Excellent. So I shared a bit about you. Can you fill in the blanks for us and share more about the path you took to get where you're at today? Yeah, well, actually, I always like to start this story with my grandfather, who in 1949 was a charter subscriber to Rodale's Organic Gardening and Farming magazine. This was just after World War II. A lot of people don't, re- I mean, I wasn't even born then. Uh-huh. A lot of people today don't realize that there was quite a struggle post-World War II in agriculture, mm-hmm. whether we go the chemical or the non-chemical approach. Of course, leading the non-chemical was, you know, the, the iconic leader, uh, J.I. Rodale. Yep. Uh, there were other people, of course, Sir Albert Howard and Lady Eve Balfour and Louis Bromfield, Ed Faulkner. I mean, these are all, in, in, in our genre, these are our... <laughs> our idols. <laughs> these are our idols. You better believe it, yes. And so he grabbed on this very early and realized that the chemical approach was not the right approach. He had a very, very large uh, garden fruit. He had a lot of bramble fruits, strawberries, an octagonal chicken house. He grew sugar beets and mangles in a couple sections of the garden, and he would put those in his root cellar and skewer them on on, uh, finishing nails in this chicken house so that the chickens could have have fresh, starchy root uh, vegetable material Uh in in the wintertime when there wasn't any grass. He was way ahead of his time, and my dad dad, uh, glummed onto that from him Mm -hmm. and got this ecological dimension. But then after World War II, my dad flew in the Navy in World War II, and then after World War II went to Indiana University on the GI Bill, and majored in economics. So the cool thing about my background is I stand on the shoulders of these two, my grandfather and my dad, who were economic environmentalists. And that's a pretty cool eclectic combination. No kidding. And so as a result, as I came along as a child, you know, dad was a, he was an accountant. After he finished college, he always, as a little child, he wanted to have a farm in a developing country. He was all ready for a new adventure. So he went with Texas Oil as a bilingual accountant to Venezuela, Mm -hmm. worked for about eight years, saved up enough money to buy a thousand acre farm in the highlands of Venezuela. And he had us, we're living on the farm. He was going to do dairy and chickens. He had these two sons coming on. My sister hadn't been born yet. My brother was three years older than I. And when, when my brother was seven and I was four in 19... Sixty, there was a revolution, a junta. Of course, we you know we were Americans without ties to diplomats or, right. or corporations or missions or anything like that. We were just expats out there in the countryside, so we were prime targets for the disenfranchised indigenous folks there. Mm-hmm. And basically, we fled the back door as the machine guns came in the front door, lost wow. everything, went to Caracas for a couple of months, tried to get protection. Nobody would even give us the time of day. So there wasn't anything to do but just get on a ship and come back to the U.S. That was in Easter morning, 1961. Dad was still hoping to go back, and his heart was there. He loved the country, loved the people. He spoke Spanish like a native, and his heart was really there. And so if we were going to start over, he wanted to do it here in a place that if they made a change there, we could get to the Venezuelan embassy quickly and get stuff settled to go back. Right. So we looked at farms in a circle from about Lancaster, P.A., down here through the Shenandoah Valley and down as, as far south as Charlotte and Raleigh-Durham, North Carolina. 
which was at that time a day's drive from Washington, D.C. And in fact, of course, you know, things did not get better in Venezuela. In fact, we could argue they're worse today than, than they were even then. Oh, yeah. So we, we never went back. But we looked at these farms, and so we settled here in the most worn-out, gullied rock pile that we could find. It was very, very cheap and settled here. And it turned out to be an incredibly strategic decision one was that the family who was living here had a daughter with uh, cerebral palsy and in the 50s had put in a swimming pool. And when dad found out, when, when he, I mean, I was just four, okay, I was 61. Mm -hmm. uh, when dad found out that, that this is in the days before swimming pools were common and at that time they would fill and drain that pool every single week from the well. Oh, wow. And that got dad's attention. He said, wow. If you want water, this place has water. And so we have a wonderful, wonderful well that, of course, he could not have foreseen that now we would be processing thousands of chickens here. Mm -hmm. And that uses a fair amount of water. Oh, yeah. And so our wonderful uh, well water source has been a real godsend in the trajectory that we've gone. Oh, yeah. So you've been there since 1960? 1961. So we came in here in, in the early summer of 1961, and Dad asked everybody, he said, how do I make a living on this farm? And he had government and private consultants come to the farm and, and offer their advice. How do you make a living on this farm? Every single one of them said, plant corn, build silos, put in a feedlot, mm -hmm. borrow more money, graze the forest, you know, blah, blah, blah. Well, this is where Dad's environmental deal kicked in. And, of course, that wasn't, he knew none of that was correct. And he knew that the chemical approach was like a drug addiction. Right. And so mom went to work outside, dad went to work outside, kind of put the farm as a big training ground, experimental place. Part-time job. Yeah. Worked in town, and the town jobs paid off the mortgage. Mm -hmm. That took about 10 years. You know, the older I get, the smarter dad was. <laughs> of course. <laughs> a lot of people kind of go through that. I heard one guy say, you know the day you become an adult, when you forgive your parents all their failures and, and realize, you know what, they did the best they could. Yeah. That's the day you become an adult. Yeah. Anyway, so I remember I was very small, maybe seven years old or so, and uh, Dad met a guy someplace, and Sunday afternoon he said, we're going to take a drive. And we drove up the valley here and visited a farmer that had portable huts. And I still don't remember whether it was lambs, pigs, I don't know, goats, I don't know what it was. Mm -hmm. But anyway, his epiphany was this portable thing, that, that have portable infrastructure uh -huh. so we can move animals around. And so Dad actually invented an electric fencing system in the early 1960s so we could start moving the cows around. And then portable infrastructure, we had portable rabbit structure for my brother. My brother had rabbits, and we couldn't keep the rabbits in, so we retrofitted that for chickens when I started with the chickens, and pasture poultry was born. I mean, that's literally the <laughs> that serendipity. Wow. The whole thing came from Dad's realization of the simple phrase, animals move. Oh, yes. We live in a culture that doesn't believe animals move. We, we lock them up in factories and put them in little cages and da-da-da. And so this whole notion that animals move and they move out Side and they get grass means you have to have portable shelter, portable control, because the neighbors don't want us. So you have to keep them home with portable control, portable shelter, portable food, and portable water. And so it was that movement concept that drove us down this innovative path that we've developed today with all this movement that we do of this, what I call the ballet and the pasture, the, the right. choreography of the, of the pasture where you have the permaculture idea of stacking so chickens follow the cows, sanitize behind the cows. One of the first things dad built was a large, and this was in the late 1960s, we still use it today, was a, an extremely large portable shade structure for the cows. So that it's like a portable shade tree. Mm -hmm. So instead of losing instead of losing the manure under a couple of trees, you know, campsites, as we moved them around, we could give the cows comfort. Right. But we could tell them, we want you to put your manure right here, you know, today. We could put it on a rock pile or a patch of brambles or something. That was very important. That is absolutely brilliant. So if I heard you correctly, you said wherever you put the shade is where the cows poop? Yeah. <laughs> wow. <laughs> and of course, most of the nitrogen is in the urine. Of course. It's on a hot day, a lot yep. of it evaporates. So under the shade, the shade gives it a whole day to gradually percolate into the ground. Mm -hmm. And so in the early days, 
you could take a, if we'd had drones back then, you could have taken an aerial picture and you could have just pinpointed the little green squares. Yep. And, they, and they lasted for five years. We call it the five-year jet stream, the shadow yeah. under this for five years in the fertility. Today, now our fertility is so high that, that we don't see the, the additional green. But back then, we sure did. And so the whole deal, we started putting branches in the gullies to hold the water and create some silt. We did dry bridges. That was a technique Dad learned in Venezuela, Mm -hmm. where you take a gully and you just throw 18 inches of stones in the bottom, and it slows the water, and pretty soon you get a terrace behind it. This is in the 60s, remember. This is before Bill Mollison Uh and Dave Holmgren. They were developing their ideas, but this is before all that was theirs. I make this point just to show how far ahead of his time Dad was Mm -hmm. to develop these concepts in the early 60s. So then dad passed away in 1988. I came back to the farm full time in uh, September 24, 1982. And it wasn't a going concern. In other words, the farm had never made a living. It never made a salary. Dad and mom were still working off the farm. But the farm was paid for. We were debt free. And I always wanted a farm from my earliest memories as a child. Mm -hmm. I loved the farm. And I think if I could boil that down to an idea Remember, I was a little child, four years old, going through this trauma of Venezuela, Mm -hmm. the insecurity of that. I mean, mom and dad's fears. Of course, they tried to protect us boys from that. Mm -hmm. But this was a a life or death and life-changing upheaval. Oh, I'm sure. I think for me, the farm represented a nest of security. And so for me to be able to walk out the back door every day and feel hugged by abundance, I'm getting teary talking about it. It was an extremely powerful thought of being able to be nestled like that. Mm -hmm. But secondly, in this gullied rock pile here, we had so little soil on this farm that when Dad started with the electric fence and moving the cows around, we didn't have enough soil to hold up electric fence stakes. Oh, my. He went to town and got used car tires, poured concrete in them, and then pushed a half-inch pipe, two of them, one straight up and down and one on a little bit of an angle, Mm -hmm. and he would pile these on the tractor platform. And my brother and I, you know, we were little kids, but the two of us were strong enough that we could get on the edge of these concrete tires and tip them off of the tractor platform as Dad drove slowly down through the field. And then Dad would go along and put the stakes in these tires to build electric fence because we had so little soil Hmm. We, we couldn't even stick electric fence stakes in the ground. So I grew up, my earliest memories here were being able to walk the farm and never set foot on a piece of vegetation. It was that barren, brambles and weeds, broom sedge and, and rocks. What have you done between then and now to actually build it out, and what's it look like today? Yeah, well, today it's arguably the most abundant farm in the neighborhood, and there are no rocks. There's those great big quarter-acre shale, saucer, rock, moonscapes are now 12 inches of soil on top. It's incredible. And so to be able today to know not only can I walk out into this abundant, that that nature wants to be abundant. Nature is not a reluctant partner. Nature is not a partner that we ask to dance and nature says, no, I don't want to dance with you. (laughs) Right. Nature wants to dance with us. And not only that, Nature wants to immerse us, to overwhelm us in abundance. Yeah. So many times in agriculture, farmers feel like they're in a wrestling match. Mm-hmm. It's not a partnership. It's farmers feel like they have to make a hostile takeover you know, <laughs> exactly. of nature. And, and so, so for me now to be able to walk out, not only realizing that nature wants to heal and wants to be well and wants to bless us with abundance, but that I can have a participatory visceral part Mm. as a partner in that healing, that's almost overwhelming. It's almost overwhelming. I often tell people that the only place that lack lives on the planet is between our ears. Because when I look at the abundance on my small farm here in Phoenix, Arizona, it's mind-blowing, the amount of yeah. apples and peaches and carrots and, and yeah. things that just grow in the space. It's just amazing. Yes, yes. Darren Dougherty of Region Ag says, we talk a lot about climate change, but the hardest climate to change is the climate of the mind. Yes. <laughs> My, my son Daniel has a good way of, he says, he says our problem is not resources, it's not, it's not even lack of understanding or technical skill. 
our weak link is constipation of imagination. <laughs> oh, I love that. I love that. Wow. So repairing the soil, you started with rocks in 1961. Has yeah. it just been decades of deposits of animal manure? Well, several things. The first thing is to realize that perennials, and, and you know this with permaculture, the energy flow of perennials is into the soil, the perennial savings account, if you will, mm-hmm. is in the soil, whereas an annual, the savings account is above the soil in a big fruit or a big squash mm-hmm. or a kernel of corn. Right. So the annual tends to pull energy from the ground and put it in some big succulent seed or something above the ground. The perennial tends to hold back a little bit of its above ground abundance and it pumps solar energy via photosynthetic activity. Mm -hmm. It pumps it into the ground. And so as we began moving the cows around and by the mid, well, let's see, I was in college mid to late 70s. So one summer when I was home from college, June was hay, July was project, and then August was getting firewood, so mom and dad would have firewood all winter. Mm -hmm. That was kind of the way my three-month summer went in college. So one year, July, my project was that I hand-dug and put in about 300 electric fence posts, essentially created our, what we have today is our permanent electric fence system. Wow. And that allowed us to move our movement of the cows, a three- or four-day rotation, Mm -hmm. to move it to a one-day and when we went to a one-day rotation, it was like an explosion. It was, And that's why I always tell people, they ask me, you know, what should I do? They look, before you buy soil amendments, before you plant seed, before you do anything, start moving your animals every day. And if you start moving them every day, the dramatic change will make a lot of these other things that you think are the weak link mm-hmm. obsolete. They won't even be the weak link. So when that happened, the grass began to really take off. And these big rock areas were like a wound on your hand. And every year, the new grass, the new sod would come up over them two or three feet every year. Wow. And so over 20 years, slowly, these things just healed. By 2005 or so, somewhere around 10 years ago, finally, the last little (laughs) pieces closed up. And now I can't show you those. But I well remember... Somewhere around 10, 12 years ago, the last little, you know, it, it, it finally closed up wow. and closed over those, over those rocks. And yeah. so it was mainly creating an energy, we call this pulsing the pasture, the heartbeat of the pasture. It was creating such a pasture organic matter pulse with the sloughed off roots, with the good control, mm-hmm. the pruning of the perennial, that the excess prunings, the excess humus created by that pulsing actually overtook and conquered those rocks and brought the soil up over them. Well, once we get healthy soil like that, the the soil actually grows on its own, does it not? Yes, absolutely. Soil doesn't deepen, it actually (laughs) uppens. Nice. (laughs) And then, of course, we were composting. We began really, really large-scale composting. That was something that I brought to the table. Dad passed away in 88. I was just 31. He died pretty young, and I was young, and I was looking at how to move this thing forward. I have totally got the composting thing. We'd already always composted with the garden and stuff. How can we do this on a really, really great big scale? And so gradually, over a couple of years, I developed this hole where we feed under a shed. It's, the shed doesn't have sides on it. Mm-hmm. We feed there and have a vertically movable gate, the cows, a box that the cows eat out of, We have a very large industrial chipper, and we buy chips, we buy Mm -hmm. carbon. We run this farm. We don't buy chemical fertilizer, but we do put a lot of time, attention, and labor on carbon. This is a carbon economy farm. I've gotten chipped Christmas trees. I've shoveled leaves. I've got corn cobs, Mm -hmm. (laughs) sawdust, bark mulch. If there's carbon available, we're like vultures on a carcass when it comes to carbon. I developed this system where we feed hay, we put a car, what would I call a carbonaceous diaper under the cows and let it grow as a static pile, add corn to it, the corn ferments, we put the pigs in, the pigs then seek the fermented corn and convert it from anaerobic to aerobic compost. So the pigs do all the turning and mm-hmm. churning and aerating of the compost, and then that goes back out on the field as our fertility program. And so once we kind of got that whole thing very, very functional about 25 years ago, boy, things really took off. 
We don't pull soil samples. We just keep on putting carbon down. Uh-huh. And we had a friend that bought a place nearby, and he said he wanted to take some soil samples. He said, could I come over to your place? I mean, it's only four miles away. He said, could I come over to your place and just for comparison? And so he did and sent it in to Neil Kinsey at Kinsey Agriculture Services. He's a Albrecht disciple. And Neil Kinsey, he's a mineral guy. He, you know, he's all right. about minerals, calcium minerals. Our soil samples all came back completely saturated with calcium. And we haven't applied any lime in 60 years. Mm-hmm. So my deal is, what does the soil need to eat? What's the weak link in your garden, my garden, my farm? What's the weak link? And it's so easy to assume that it's something that comes in a bag. Mm -hmm. And actually, the weak link is completely closing that whole solar biomass decomposition cycle. And that includes getting our landscape hydrated with good, proper everything from ponds to swales Mm -hmm. to roof catchment to whatever, as Yeoman's always said. Don't let a drop of surface runoff leave your place. Exactly. Make it go through several cycles before it leaves. So if we combine the hydration with the biomass cycle, the soil is going to it's going to thrive. Yeah. Just with those things going on. That's the natural template. Exactly. You know, I love that you say that. Thank you. It confirms what I've been saying for years, and that's how you fix unhealthy soil is you add organic matter and then add organic matter and add lots more organic matter. <laughs> Yeah, I couldn't agree with you more. That's exactly what we've done here. So we literally spread hundreds of tons, thousands of tons now of compost, and we don't buy it in. We generate it on site. We have bought in carbon in the past. I mean, goodness, if we drive by some neighbor's field (laughs) and he's got 20 rotting round bales out there that he's not going to do anything with, and he'll give them to us, Mm -hmm. man, we go and go down there with the low boy and pick those boogers up and bring them home. Yeah. We're just fiends on, on, on carbon. <laughs> and I watch the neighborhood for bags of leaves as I'm driving around. Yes. Oh, yeah. When I drive around in the fall and I see people raking up leaves and burning them. <laughs> oh, I know. Oh, my heart bleeds. I view it as shaking your fist in the face of nature. Yeah. Saying, I hate you, Earth. That's a strong statement, but that's the way I feel. So I have two of my neighbors trained to bring me their leaves in the fall, so... <laughs> Do you give them a bone? When they... <laughs> hey, well, they get some eggs from us, yeah. Yeah, well, I've got the power utility crews that chip, you know, branches and the power line and stuff. We've got a couple of those crews trained, and I give them a, some eggs or at Thanksgiving, you know, I give them a turkey. Yep. Man, that it's just, we, they just come and dump. And if, you know, if, if you have some windstorm or something in the area, sometimes they'll bring 10 loads in a week. Wow. If they're in the area and working hard. Add organic matter. Everybody out there listening, you heard Joel Salatin say, add organic matter and lots of it. Yeah, that's correct. You almost can't get too much. Exactly. So if I was to walk in the front gate at Polyface, what would I experience? How many acres is there? What's it look like? What are you doing? (laughs) Well, we own 650 acres, and 180 of those acres are open land. Mm. The balance is woodland, so we have a lot of forest. I mean, we have 400 and 70 acres of forest. So in a lot of ways, it is a forest farm. And one thing you would drive in, you would see a lot of green grass, you'd see a lot of trees, and the buildings are pretty utility. Mm -hmm. Here's what you would not see. You would not see silos. You would not see a bank barn or a gamble barn. or Mm -hmm. They're just pole structures, very simple, multi-use pole structures. You would not see a white yard fence. We don't even have a yard fence. It just is. Yeah. What you would see are chickens out in the field. You would see pigs, see turkeys out in the field. You'd see cows in the field, sheep, ducks. Doing what they're supposed to do. Yeah, yeah, they're all out there. But the other thing, the, the one of the main things that people remark when they come is there's no smell. Normally, when you think of a livestock farm, the first thought is flies and odors. Mm-hmm. And we've always said that good farming should be aesthetically and aromatically sensually romantic. Oh, nice. (laughs) We're a commercial operation, Mm -hmm. and then we lease about eight other properties in the community. So we're really managing almost 2,000 acres. I mean, we're running 1,000 head of cattle, so it's not a backyard operation. Mm -hmm. And there's about 20 of us from, from truck driver distribution to marketing to accounting to to the farming elements of it, there's about 20 of us that 
generate our full-time income here from the farm. So it's a a $2.5 million enterprise servicing about 5,000 families, 50 restaurants, and a handful of uh, retail outlets. And what do you grow there on your farm that you sell? We're primarily in what we call pastured pastured livestock. Mm -hmm. So we have beef, pork, chicken, both uh, meat and eggs, Mm -hmm. turkey, rabbit, duck, egg, lamb. I think I named them all. Mm -hmm. And then because of the forest, we also have a bandsaw mill. And so we sell a lot of firewood, obviously, in the wintertime. A lot of winter work, a lot of firewood. And, of course, we have saw logs, so we mill lumber for our own projects and to sell. We can custom mill lumber for people. And then, of course, the branches, we chip. Those chips become the compost in the hay shed for the cows. So uh, there's an ongoing forestry aspect that we actually spend with with as much time in. And with all the lease properties, there's always encroachment on a fence line Mm -hmm. or a new fence to build with trees in it. I haven't even added up how many miles, but I mean, it's miles and miles and miles of of fence line that we maintain. And so that, of course, creates uh, carbon areas as well. One of the important things that we've done is permaculture style ponds. So we do have elevation here on the farm. Mm -hmm. So we've built about 15 ponds over the years that are connected with piping. We have about eight miles of inch and a quarter underground water line Mm -hmm. on the farm that gravity feeds from these high ponds. It's all gravity, no pumps, no electricity. Nice. We have 80 PSI water over the whole farm with every 100 yards is a valve. So all the livestock and everything. So this is the portable water I was talking about. Yes, exactly. The portable water. So our investment over time of getting these millions of gallons of water stored that we can gravity feed down to the farm, these are not springs, they're not creeks, it's simply valleys that fill during a water event, whether it's a big rain mm-hmm. or a snow melt or something like that. And we've now got enough stored, finally, over the years, we've invested a lot in this, we finally have enough stored that we're now doing very serious irrigation using the uh, K-Line irrigation system from New Zealand, that is just spectacular. Basically, your water is free. Yeah, the water is free. Now, when, when we irrigate, we do pump that with an electric pump mm-hmm. because we can't get enough flow and volume to run the irrigators from the gravity mm, system. Right. So the gravity system feeds a low ballast tank that we're pumping out of. So we've got water coming in and, and pumping out, but the electric pump revs it up enough with enough pressure and volume, whatever it is, 100 150 gallons a minute or something, to be able to run a bunch of these little nozzles. Right. We're able to dump about an inch of water on a half an acre every four hours. It adds up. No kidding. So I want to touch on your mission a little bit, because I read your mission the other day, and it was a little bit jaw-dropping for me because it's so future-looking, and that is to develop environmentally, economically, and emotionally enhancing agriculture prototypes and facilitate their duplication around the world. So not only are you a fully running farm, you have an intent to transform the global food system. Yes, not only the food system, but the whole farm system. I mean, food and farm are closely linked. We are very clear that we want to offer a credible alternative to make obsolete the entire factory farming system. Yay. With the scale where we are now, we have a credible, it's one thing for a person to have 10 or 12 chickens and wax eloquent about self-sufficiency and blah, blah, blah. And that's great. And and I'm the biggest fan in the world. But when you're out there, okay, Mm -hmm. out there, and you're trying to promote this kind of a system, the naysayers look at you, how much are you producing? What can this feed the world And, and that sort of thing? And what's the reality of it? So you and I both know that ultimately the way to feed the world is with a whole lot of edible backyard and kitchen chickens, yep. throw out the dog, the cat, the gerbil, and the pet boa constrictor and put in two chickens to eat your food scraps and give you eggs. Uh-huh. I mean, that's the ultimate recycling, right? Yes. You and I know that. It's a vision in persuasion. If you're a 10 and you're talking to a 1, you have a hard time communicating because mm-hmm. we don't move in leaps of 1 to 10. Exactly. We move in little steps of 1 to 2, 2 to 3, 3 to 4. And so this is one of the reasons why we're not hung up on heritage breeds. Listen, I love heritage breeds. Nobody's a bigger fan of heritage breeds. But a $150 razor-breasted dark meat turkey that weighs 12 pounds does not offer a credible alternative 
to the entire factory farming system right now. Amen. So we use the industry genetics, you know, the Cornish cross, the double-breasted mm -hmm. uh, turkey. Yep. But we do it on pasture, without vaccines, without medications, with GMO-free local grain that we buy from our neighbors. It is 90%. If you say that a, that a heritage breed is 100% perfect, uh -huh. our bird, let's say, is 90%. But it's affordable by everybody. Yep. And it's not so different that everybody thinks you're a weirdo when they look at it. And so you don't have to have a different recipe. And so this is what I'm talking about. So I'm the first to admit that we choose our compromises. Some would call it our hypocrisy. Mm -hmm. But we choose our compromises strategically as part of this mission to offer a credible alternative that we can actually look and make a good case for anybody and explain to them there is not one reason for a single factory farm on the whole planet. And if we can get to that point, yeah. if we can get to that point, then we can get to another step. But if we never get to that point, if people never have a credible alternative or never confronted with a credible alternative, then they just dismiss us and we're just kooks and, well, that's the way it is. Oh, yeah. Well, I've been seen as a kook on this mission for quite a few years. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, I call myself a lunatic, you know, yeah. so I have fun with it that way. I never made a business plan. We still don't have any marketing benchmarks. But what we are devoted to is we are devoted to healing the land mm -hmm. and offering a credible alternative to the entire dysfunctional industrial food system. Healing the land one bite at a time. I love that. That's right. So you are a prolific writer. You've put out 12 books over the past couple of decades. One of my favorites is, folks, this ain't normal. So let's start with that one. Tell us about that book. That book grew out of a lot of college speaking I was doing. And I still speak at colleges, but there for a while, it just seemed like I was in colleges all the time, you know, environmental science oh, yeah. classes and things like that, and guest lecture series and things. And, and it just struck me how short a memory uh, we have as humans and how we're on such a fast technology trajectory mm -hmm. that it struck me in my conversations with these college students, they actually felt like their world was very normal, from smartphones to video games to being able to pop down and get a Snickers bar out of a vending machine all of this was extremely normal. And of course, you know, I'm not real old, but I have had the privilege of knowing some really old people here in the community mm -hmm. over my life. And as I've looked at the track record of normalcy, it was just one of these things. I was actually doing a Q&A one time and in humorous exasperation uh -huh. at this college student, I said, folks, this ain't normal, you know, <laughs> uh, describing Velveeta cheese. <laughs> right. Oh my gosh. No kidding or food with unpronounceable ingredients. And everybody laughed with good natured. But that struck this idea in my head, and I'm a bit of an idea salesman. And so I'm always listening for opportunities to, how do you sound bite it better? How do you say it in a more compelling way? And that really struck. So anyway, I, that, was, that was the basis of the book. It's, I just went through a lot of things starting. You know, the first chapter starts out with kids with no chores. You don't have to look back very long. Mm -hmm to remember or to realize that children had chores. And it wasn't just take out the garbage or feed the cat. It was chop wood for the tender box. It was pull weeds in the green beans. Clean the pool or do the grass. Yeah, yeah. And there was serious work to do for children. I start there, but I go through a lot of these things, including chemical fertilizer rather than carbon-based fertility program, unpronounceable food. And it's really resonated. It's yeah. amazing how many letters I've gotten from 70-year-old people who, wow, you captured this. One of the favorite things that people enjoy is my rendition of the Thanksgiving hog killing. You know, this was a community event, uh -huh. family event. Everybody'd come together and four or five farmers would pull their hogs together and around Thanksgiving because that's when the weather's cool. Mm -hmm. We'd dress them all and Three years old, had their jobs all the way up to the oldest matriarch or patriarch, had their roles, and it was an amazing thing. And, and we've just lost a lot of this... History. Yeah, food, farm, cultural normalcy. Yeah. 
the whole point of the book is that in a time when so many think that we're going to be able to sail off into some Star Trek nirvana and sever our ecological umbilical, that's not a horse that's won any races. That horse has never won a race. Yes. It's a completely untried horse. Mm-hmm. And if we're going to bet on a horse race... That's not the one. Yeah, I'm going to bet on the horse that's probably run one, two, or three races. Mm-hmm. Because that's the horse that's on the winning track. And when we look at how nature works, what people have eaten, how they have lived over time, that's the horse to bet on. This idea of single serving, everything wrapped in plastic, unpronounceable food and chemical hydroponic tomatoes, that is such a tiny time part of history that it doesn't even register as a blip on the continuum of history. And so if we really want to function as functional societies and functional families, maybe we ought to look at the things that were normal. hundred years ago? Yeah, 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 exactly. So I teach at one of the local universities here, Arizona State University, and one of the papers that my students have to write is, what is real food? They have to go on a discovery of (laughs) what is real food for you, and they have to interview three people and... It's been a life changer for hundreds of students. Oh, I'll bet. I'll bet. That is fantastic. Yeah, that's great. Good for you. So I'm just scanning the book. There's no compost, no digestion, the poop, the whole poop, and nothing but the poop. So those two are intertwined, I'm sure. (laughs) Well, the one talks about that if food won't rot, it won't digest. In other words, you can't build life out of something that hasn't already lived, Mm -hmm. this wonderful principle of sacrifice for life, that in order for something to live, something has to die, just so foundational in ecology. The whole life, death, decomposition, regeneration, life, death, decomposition, regeneration, Mm -hmm. that is a cycle that forms our whole ecology cycle. So I talk in there about if food won't rot, you probably shouldn't eat it. And the difference between, (laughs) for example, squeezing Velveeta cheese on a table walk away from it, you can come back a year later and it's just sitting there. But if you put real cheese on there, in 24 hours, it grows mold and it grows legs and walks off the table. (laughs) Exactly. (laughs) And so when you realize that all of our food science in the last, whatever, 70 years, all of our food science has been trying to make shelf-stable food, shove the sell-by date farther on to where now we have ultra-pasteurized milk that is shelf-stable for 12 months. Whoa. Folks, this ain't normal. And so that's the whole idea of the decomposable Mm -hmm. ability. The poop, the whole poop, nothing but the poop. That was my funnest chapter to write. I'll bet. That was going back to 1900, right before the automobile, when all the urban newspapers were running big articles about the implosion of the city, that the cities were growing. This was industrial, early industrial era, Mm -hmm. and people were leaving the farms, moving to the cities, but the cities did not have automobiles and so everything was horse drawn and ox drawn and mule drawn right and as cities grew the concentration of human poop i mean there wasn't indoor plumbing and so you had outhouses even in the city and so the combination of all this these draft animals imagine if all the trucks stopped tomorrow and all that was hauled by Mm -hmm. draft animals who have to urinate and poop your whole life was wrapped up around poop. It was in the street. It was at the door. You had it on your shoes when you walked into the bakery. (laughs) You had it on your shoes when you walked in. It was everywhere. And everybody was shoveling, 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 and all this poop. The whole experience of that, of course, was gone when the automobile came. So there was a cultural disdain. People were tired of shoveling poop. Yeah. So I always say, be careful crucifying Grandpa in 1948. After his life of shoveling, somebody presented him with a little bag of material and said, you don't have to shovel anymore. All you got to do is spread some of this, and it'll be great. Sir Albert Howard wrote an agricultural testament in 1943, which introduced the scientific formula for aerobic composting to the world. But we didn't have the infrastructure to metabolize his great gift to the planet, which was scientific aerobic composting, because that required biomass handling and Farmers were tired of handling biomass. <laughs> yeah. And so it wasn't yet for another 10 years or 15 that we started getting front end loaders and chippers and piping water so we could water compost and all the different little pieces that allowed us to have a workable, functional, economic, and credible biomass 
system on the regular farm scale to actually have something that could authentically displace this little bag of chemical fertilizer. Right. I was pretty forgiving for Grandpa in the post-World War II. Mm -hmm. I'm less forgiving by about the late 50s, and by the mid-60s, there's no forgiveness at all, because by that time, we had all the infrastructure, all the abilities, everything to be able to have very economical biomass accumulation and distribution. There's a progression there. Yeah. Well, and so much of your biomass composting that is happening on your farm, you're just doing it right in place. Yes. When you look at nature, what are the patterns that we see in nature? One of the things we see in nature is Uh carbon doesn't get shipped anywhere. Right. And about the farthest carbon goes is as far as it takes an herbivore to eat grass in a valley and go up on a hilltop Mm -hmm. to watch for predators and ruminate and poop. As far as it takes a bird to eat seeds down in a marsh and go up on a tree and sit there and digest and poop, or a leaf to fall from a tree and blow, or a grass plant to turn brown, fall over, and lodge on Mm -hmm. site. But this idea of shipping carbon, so the pattern of nature is that fertility is maintained and enhanced with in-situ solar-driven biomass recycling, in-situ. Right there. Yeah, right there. Yep. Beautiful. I want to just review some of your other books here. We won't go into them because you have so many great ones. Salad Bar Beef. You've got, oh, this is, I love this one. Everything I Want to Do is Illegal. Worst <laughs> Stories from the Local Food Front. That's really about creating social change, I'm sure, right? Oh, yeah. Yeah. It's actual stories from our farm, the different things that we've wanted to do, but they're illegal. And this includes things from intern housing to to food safety things. It's a very broad plate. The truth is that our regulatory environment is not fundamentally there to protect the average person. It's there to protect the biggest current entities, protect their market share, protect their access to market, and make uh, prejudicial hurdles for innovation. That's one of my favorites. Nice. My most recent one is Your Successful Farm Business. Uh That one's been out for about two months. And that is everything we've learned the 20 years since writing You Can Farm. Mm -hmm. I call it the graduate level past You Can Farm. That one was fun to write, and that's the most, the latest. Another one of the real late ones is my first attempt at a children's book with my daughter, Rachel. Uh She's quite an artist. And uh, it's Patrick's Great Grass Adventure with Greg the Grass Farmer. I get so tired of these stereotypical children's books about farming where Farmer John has a horse, and the horse eats oats, and the oats is in a in a red gambrel barn with a silo next mm-hmm. to it and a rooster on the fence. And, and, and you have all these, you know, these stereotype things. So I wanted to offer something that would present information, education, along with a storyline. And so my daughter and I came up with this idea. It's actually selling pretty well. We're thinking about a second one. This is an introduction to grass farming, to the movement and the mm-hmm. paddock, the diversity that's in a multi-speciated prairie-type setting, Mm -hmm. that it's not just a lawn. The thing is, the average person is brain-damaged about grass. When you say grass, they think either golf course or lawn. And when I think grass, I'm thinking, you know, everything from Paul Panicum to switchgrass to red top and all sorts of different kinds of grasses that are wonderful cafeteria mix that's in a perennial uh, Mm -hmm. meadow-type setting. Well, in permaculture, we call those the pioneer species. They're the ones that show up first and do the heavy lifting for us, heavy digging. Yes, yes, that's right. Wow. All right. So you can find all of Joel's books on our show notes page. And do you have? I'm sure you have a website for them. We do. Uh, it's polyfacefarms.com. P-O-L-Y-F-A-C-E. It'll, uh, it'll probably pop up. Perfect. I'm going to shift on you, and I'd like for you to talk about a time you failed, how you overcame that failure, and what you learned from it. Yeah. One of the biggest ones that comes to mind was we wanted to add sheep, and we weren't fenced for sheep, and I'm not a big fan of dogs. So I was trying to have a self-contained portable corral, basically, that I could pull around with a tractor, pull around with a pickup that would be light enough and big enough to actually have a bunch of sheep in it. And so I had this brainstorm to build a Schedule 80, which is that big, thick, gray stuff, like half an inch thick, PVC. PVC, yep. uh, PVC corral that was 50 by 100 feet. It was massive. And I just had upright sheet panel around the edges, Uh very, very light. I just move it around. So we went out, we bought all the stuff. 
not cheap. It was like three thousand dollars to get all. I mean, that stuff's expensive. Oh yeah. Put it all together and got it done finally. Hooked up to pull it. We didn't have the sheep in it yet, but we. But I hooked up to pull it on its maiden voyage. Happened to be a kind of brisk morning. I don't know what, 20 degrees or something. Pulled it five feet and it cracked. It was yep. cold and it just was brittle and just cracked. And immediately I realized the whole thing was a failure. It would not work. Yeah. We just put that time in 3000 bucks and we threw it away. And so my takeaway from that was one of our um, 20 commandments today of things mm-hmm. not to do. Uh-huh. And one of those is never, ever, ever construct something out of PVC. PVC is for water. It yep. works really, really well as water pipe. Uh-huh. But never construct anything out of PVC. Exactly. <laughs> People use it for greenhouses and stuff, and it's, yeah, yeah that doesn't yeah. work either. Yeah, no, I've seen so many caved in, blown away, collapsed, leaning toward fissures, structures. People build chicken shelters. Oh, yeah. They crack, the sun makes it brittle. PVC is a wonderful material if you're moving water. Mm-hmm. But boy, if be out here taking the abuse of construction material, yeah. better to go with wood or steel. Yeah. You and I are about the same age within a couple of years. And back in high school, a friend of mine, Tim, he and I used to build things in the mid to late 70s. And he always used to tell me, Greg, if you have a nail to put in, use a hammer. Don't use a screwdriver. Always use the correct tool for the job. And that has stuck yeah. with me here, what, 40 years later? Yep, that's exactly right. So what do you consider your biggest success? Well, the biggest success is having our son run the farm. My little phrase is that the ultimate sustainability, we talk about sustainability or regenerative capacity all the time. Mm -hmm. To me, the ultimate is do your kids want it when you're gone? Yeah. And ultimately, if we can't create businesses, farms, food systems that the children want are inspired and Mm -hmm drawn to, we failed. I mean, we have two children. One has taken over the farm. Our daughter, Rachel, who did this children's book with me, lives 10 miles away. She's an artist. She's executive director of a nonprofit art school in town. They both enjoy the farm. What we want is longevity. You yeah. want continuity. We told both of our kids early on, we will be your biggest cheerleader no matter what you want to do. But If you don't want the farm, we are going to seek a young person Mm -hmm. to give it to. We're not going to give it to you just to sell, to take the money and go live in the Bahamas for the rest of your life. So for me, my greatest blessing or success, I feel like, has been creating an environment that Daniel wanted. And he's now late 30s. We have three grandchildren and they all have their enterprises. Travis is 14. He's had his duck enterprise for several years. Andrew's 12. He's had sheep for three years. Wow. He's our shepherd. And Lauren, nine, has her exotic chicken raising pullet business. She raises fluffy, feathery chickens and sells them two and three at a time to backyard enthusiasts in town. Beautiful. This is all part of creating an environment that attracts Mm -hmm. the kids into it. Let them start young, have their entrepreneurial businesses, learn how hard it is to make a profit and how important cash flow is and those kinds of things. Yeah, We're real blessed and thankful that our kids loved it. Yeah, well, and it's beautiful that your daughter has jumped in with kids' books. That's yeah. such an important yeah. role as well. Absolutely. I'm so thrilled. And the neat thing about doing this project with her was that when I wrote the text and she sat down what pictures we were going to use, she knew all the nuances, like a, an electric of fence course. gate handle. I didn't have to explain to her, mm-hmm. here's what it looks like. She just... You grew up with it. Right. And so the illustrations in the book, I just think they're spectacular. And anyone who does this will be struck by the authenticity of the pictures. It's not animals talking. Uh It's it's the real deal. And the animals, they're all authentic. And it's really neat to have her expertise in that. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. So what drives you? What drives me is seeing the land come alive. I would just call it healing land, to see fertility increase, biomass increase, earthworms increase, to see the transformation that happens when you, for example, weed a woodlot, take out the diseased and the crooked and the junk, and just leave nice, vigorous, healthy, growing stems. I mean, it's just transformative. 
building ponds, stopping floods by a, holding that water high on a hill. Mm. All that adds part of how do we caress the land in a way that our touch makes it respond enthusiastically with more biomass and soil fertility to where our participatory visceral touch elicits greater abundance in the commons. That's wow. to me that's just a very powerful idea. Yeah. So my listeners all know that I'm always looking for epic. What you just said there, that was priceless and beautiful. Thank you for that. Thank you. So if you could recommend one book for our listeners, what would it be and why? Anybody that knows me knows that my moniker is Christian Libertarian Environmentalist Capitalist Lunatic. (laughs) Yes. So the Bible would be there. But besides that, I would say the book that's had the biggest influence on me besides that is Stephen Covey's The Seven Habits of Highly Effective People. Wow. That's not a nature book. No. It's a book about how to live. Mm -hmm. It seems like almost not a day goes by that something from that book doesn't, whether it's start with the end in view, his whole emotional equity with relationships. Mm -hmm. We're human. We're going to make a mistake. We're going to make an emotional withdrawal with an unfit word once in a while, and we have to invest in our partners, family and non-family, with enough emotional equity that we can make a withdrawal from time to time and not jeopardize the relationship. Such a, an iconic book, I think, in our culture. and I just refer to it often. Wow, it sounds like it because you're reciting it. <laughs> yeah. So what one final piece of advice do you have for our listeners? I would say don't quit participating. At first, I thought saying just don't quit, but that's so generic. And what I want to convey with this is the listeners to this podcast are doers. They're not just focus group academics. Yep. We're a tribe that dares to get down and dirty and interact with the real issues of our homes, our communities. We don't mind getting on a pair of gloves and and sweating and getting with it. And so I added the participating on don't quit participating because Mm -hmm. it's in the participation that you get the experience, that you get the skill, that you get the mastery. And probably one of the greatest assets, equity, that anyone can put together in life is not financial. Forget that. The greatest equity you can have is mastery of something, mastery Mm -hmm. of a skill, Mm -hmm. mastery of an art form. And that requires you to not sit on the bleachers, it requires you to start up the potter's wheel and start making some pottery. It it requires you to start the chainsaw and start cutting. It requires you to get the spade and start digging. You can't do it without participating. So I say don't quit participating. It is in the participation that you get the skill and build your equity. You can't Google experience. (laughs) No kidding. So stay with it. Alan Nation, the uh, founder of Stockman Grass Farmer Magazine and longtime editor, has just come out with a wonderful book, Your Family Business Legacy. And as I read through that, I was struck by the number of times he used the word slog. He said, stay with the slog, stay with the slog. And we don't use that word much. It's a kind of a depressing word. Right. But, you know, really, a lot of life is staying with the slog. And the epiphanies, the epic times, come often serendipitously as payday for enduring the slog. Mm -hmm. And so it sounds kind of unsexy to say stay with the slog, but it is in that where your greatest joys and happiness and things will be. And that takes time. That just takes time. And so don't quit participating. Stay with it, and you will reap those benefits. Beautiful. And for those of us that are kind of wondering out there what flog is, it's just keep going. Don't stop. Yeah. No matter what pain comes. It's like, (laughs) this is what has to happen. We got to get it done. Yeah, that's right. That's right. Stay with it. Well, thank you so much for joining us on the show today, Joel. It has absolutely been an epic conversation and something that I've looked forward for the past couple of months while we've been chatting to actually get you on the show and hear your story. This has been amazing. Well, thank you. It's just been a delight and an honor to be with you. And I have very much enjoyed being able to share. And you're a great host. Thank you. It's been a real pleasure. Thank you. Thank you. So how can our listeners find you? Our website is Mm polyfacefarms.com. 
and that's an easy that's probably the easiest way uh, if you want to email me you can always email me polyface farms and Wendy, my assistant, she's the one that distributes everything to all the parties that need to get it, and so she handles that. Love to have you on there. The website has a lot of information. It has where I'm speaking, my speaking schedule. If you want to come and hear something, uh, that's great. Love to share with you anytime. Perfect. And we can also buy products from you. Yes, yes. We service a four-hour radius from the farm, so anybody Mm -hmm. within four hours of Stanton, Virginia can uh, get deliveries. Of course, we always also have a gift shop with our, our non-food items. We're just getting ready to, I think, launch a pork snack stick that will be available nationwide, actually. Mm. It is already available. If you want to send your kids to school with a real paleo, nutrient-dense thing instead of empty calories, uh-huh. these snack sticks are almost addictive, but they're actually good for you. <laughs> so nice. if there's one thing better than addiction, it's an addiction that's a good addiction. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So where do we find those at? Those are available through our gift shop on the website. Just click the gift shop and it'll pick right up. And that's where you get shirts with everything I want to do is illegal on them. <laughs> and you can get pork snack sticks. Perfect. One more time, your website? Polyfacefarms.com. Perfect. You can also find show notes from today's podcast at urbanfarm.org forward slash polyface. Well, that's it for today. Thanks for joining us on the Urban Farm Podcast. Growing plants that thrive in your yard is a lot easier than you think. It starts with saving your own seeds and letting them remember what they already learned. Just text SEEDS to 33444 or visit IWantToSaveSeeds.com and you will receive our free webinar about why seeds matter, why saving them is easy, and how to save your own. We hope you enjoyed today's episode of the Urban Farm Podcast. Remember to listen for tips, advice, and resources to help you on your journey with urban farming. You can find us on the web at urbanfarm.org or send us an email to podcast at urbanfarm.org. In the words of Vincent Van Gogh, great things are done by a series of small things brought together. Be encouraged that with each lesson learned and skill developed, you are one step closer in the direction of your dreams.